depending on who's out there. Um, this talk, uh, the origin of this talk really is, um, uh, comes from a book that I read, um, an excellent book by a guy called Kevin Toulis. And uh, the book's called My Father's Wake, How the Irish Teach Us to Live, Love and Die. And the book itself, the genesis of the book was uh, Kevin, who uh, was born, was lives in, uh, lived in uh, Scotland and then subsequently in London, came home to Ackle Island to bury his father. And uh, it was really his story of the difference between how the Irish treat dead, the dead and how he has experienced elsewhere in uh, primarily in England, but also around the world and how death is hidden from uh, view really in the UK. Whereas in Ireland, we almost celebrate death in terms of having wakes and have the bodies exposed and we, we, we gather around coffins and you know, we all have our own stories about wakes. And it was that idea uh, that really generated this talk. So the, the picture, the rather grim uh, gravestone that you, or effigy that you can see there on the left-hand side of the screen uh, is, um, is from St. Peter Church of Ireland in Drogheda. And it is, the, uh, it is the gravestone of a husband and wife, uh, Sir Edmund Golding and his wife, Elizabeth Fleming. And it dates to about 1520. Um, and it is macabre maybe to our eyes, but on the other hand, it is a celebration, I suppose, of the fact of death and the fact that uh, our bodies are mere vessels and will eventually rot and, and disintegrate. Uh, and whether we believe in an afterlife is neither here nor there really in terms of what happens to our mortal remains. Um, so the talk itself is really going to try and really in a, in a conversational sort of way, albeit with myself, a conversational sort of way about looking at how man has dealt with death from prehistory almost right through to the to the present time, and this is more or less uh, our twenty first century uh, image of death and what it means to die. We have the church service, uh, we have the funeral cortege, uh, we have the carrying of the coffin, and then we have the interment of coffin coffins are dead in designated graveyards. Uh, and that's how, to a certain extent, 21st century uh, death is um, looked at and experienced for most of us. But obviously that wasn't always the way, um, heading back into prehistory, as we'll see. So in the beginning, I suppose we're only, we, uh, as in all of us, are up here, top the top image there, Homo sapiens sapiens, that's us. Um, and you can see on that little graph, basically uh, there's the, the, the top of that screen there is, is uh, hundreds of thousands of years. So, or millions of years indeed, you're going back. Um, and so Homo sapiens, our, our modern man has really only been around for the last 120,000 years. Um, but we overlapped, as you can see there, we overlapped with Neanderthal man and all of these other various species of ourselves heading back to about 4 million years ago. But a lot of these ancestors that we have all had burial practices associated with them as they gradually became more and more cognizant and aware of themselves. And I suppose as an aside, I. This graph will continue on in this direction. We haven't stopped evolving. Um, either ourselves or other species around, around the globe have not stopped evolving. So um, we will continue. But the, the graph at the bottom then shows um, uh, us, that's us, the Homo sapiens, and how we traveled out of Africa. Our earliest, the earliest surviving um, remains of Homo sapiens sapiens, that's us up here, um, 
were in Africa about 200,000 years ago. But as you can see, we spread south down to South Africa, and then we spread out of the great out of Africa migration. And we were in Europe for about 400, for about 45 to 35,000 years ago, we were in Europe, but we spread um, west, uh, sorry, we spread east down through Australasia. We spread north up uh, across the Bering Strait and down through North America and South America. And although it's, although I won't go into too much detail, uh, hitting the south of South America by 15,000 years ago. So we spread quickly once we started to move. Um, but it's important to remember that, that uh, this is just us, uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, and prior to that, there had been various waves of, of, of uh, humanoid, if you can call it, species coming out of Africa and indeed developing their reckon independently in other parts of the world. So the earliest evidence really that we have for some sort of ritual associated with humanoid species is in the lower Paleolithic in Africa. At a, that's about between 800,000 and 1500,000 before present, but don't worry about that. That's just year, call that years ago. And this cranium, which was found in Africa about 600,000 years ago, has evidence for defleshing. In other words, they have knife marks all around the face. You can see them there, numbered one to wherever. And that indicates some sort of ritual associated with this body. Now, this body was a Homo erectus. He wasn't a sapiens. He wasn't us. He was, he was uh, our, our ancestor. Um, but even at that stage, there was quite clearly some sort of ritual associated with death. In other words, Homo erectus knew that there was a passing between life and death and that there potentially was something on the other side. And it's also uh, that, that the, this, had, this didn't happen, this event, this defleshing didn't happen when um, the person was alive. Uh, it happened post-mortem. So there was some ritual associated with this body. And then at the same sort of time, over in, uh, in, in what, what archaeologists used to, be, used to know as, uh, as uh, Peking Man, because it was found in, in, in China, um, we find again the, the interment of skulls in a particular cave. And we have, for the first time, potentially the first use of fire, um, again, about 600,000 years ago. So we have the start of the use of caves, the use of people dying in caves, staying in caves, and um, cumulatively numbers of people um, in particular areas. So we're starting to gather together ritually uh, in locations uh, uh, at this stage. And then this other, this, this amazing site in, in, in uh, Northern Spain, uh, 200,000 years ago, uh, Again, not Homo sapiens sapiens, we're talking about Homo heidelbergensis. Don't worry about the names, it's just they're different subspecies of, of uh, humanoids. And in this particular cave, uh, they found all of these uh, human remains right at the back. So, so they, you got into the cave down a very long shaft into a large opening. I'm, I'm, the, the cursor is over on the left-hand side here of the screen, into a very large cave. You then moved right to the back and you dropped down a five meter or a, a 10 meter shaft down to the bottom. And then right at the very bottom of this pit is where they found all these bones. And there was no evidence whatsoever of any animal being involved in this. There was no no marks. There was no, um, there was no uh, suggestion that an animal had dragged all of this material in. So 200,000 years ago, humanoids were climbing into this cave. They were dragging their dead to the back of the cave. They were lowering them down into a shaft and depositing them, albeit in quite a higgledy-piggledy manner, at the bottom of this uh, bone pit. And so quite clearly there was some sort of ritual going on here that there was some, there was some ritual belief that there was something beyond uh, death 200,000 years ago. So between, and then once we move into the middle, middle Paleolithic, we start to get what we would consider to be 
burials as such. Um, and we're into the Neanderthal period. So Homo sapiens Neanderthal, uh, named after a site in, in the Neander Valley in Germany. That's where Neanderthal comes from. So 100,000 years ago um, in Israel, we're getting a, a, yet another cave. Interesting, the caves seem to be consistent without this. And we have the laying out of a body. You can see it here, um, almost in a sleeping position. Uh, what, what we would today call, term a, a crouched uh, um, position, but particularly laid out. There's no suggestion that this, this, this body was dumped or, or, or uh, it was definitely placed in that position in an almost like a fetal position. Um, and then interestingly, there were uh, the, the pit itself into which this body was found uh, was covered with a fill uh, as, as if to protect it from scavenging animals. So we're beginning to see the start of some idea of actually interring bodies uh, in graves uh, rather than dumping them in pits or, or placing them haphazardly. We're beginning to see this development of a, um, a ritual placement of bodies in pits. And this is, this is something like 100,000 years ago. Again, Neanderthal, uh, our ancestors, our immediate ancestors to a certain extent, were starting to find um, pits, uh, skull here, but with animal, uh, animal bones particularly decided to um, uh, be placed. This is antlers, a, a deer antler, um, found in a child's burial, and it was dug into a, uh, into a rock pit. Um, with, as I say, uh, uh, antler bone in association. And this is a plaster cast of that burial here. You have the, the child's skull. You can see he was about 13 years old. Um, but <clears throat> again, associated with uh, animal bones, in this case, an, uh, an animal antler. And um, again, crouched position, a specific pit dog with what you might class now as grave goods beginning to appear the insertion of, of antlers. Um, and this is um, somewhere in the region of uh, 95,000 years ago. Again, um, more uh, Neanderthal burials, this time in a cave. And again, with, with, with animal bones in association, um, we're talking a, 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 a burial, again, in a crouched sort of almost sleeping position uh, 500 years ago, again in in the mid, mid, what we call the Middle Paleolithic, um, uh, in 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 France. Um, again, we're this this in this particular case, uh, you can see that there is there was an effort made to lay the body out. This is the 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 upper arm and the the lower arm, so in a in a flexed position with the knees and the legs in crouched under as if as if sleeping. Um, again, this is quite a famous uh, 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 burial in Shanidar, um, which again is in the in the Near East. Um, the most important thing about this particular burial was because it was the first time, although it's controversial, it was the first time that grave goods in terms of flowers and uh, small votive offerings were laid in the pit uh, or in the burial with this uh, um, individual. Um, it would have it would have seemed from the pollen evidence from the evidence that they got from the excavating the grave that seasonal flowers were placed um, on the body uh, uh, as it was being interred and then the entire site was covered in uh, in a pit so again more ritual more understanding if you like that uh, that there was something important about the transition between life and death in 500,000 or uh, 50,000 years ago. And it wasn't, con this, was a, this was an old, uh, 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 an adult woman, but it wasn't confined to adult women. This is uh, uh, the body of a, uh, two children um, found in a, in a round bottom pit, again, in the, in the Near East. Um, but with, again, grave goods consisting of flints and, uh, and, and animal bones in association with these two children. Um, uh, so quite clearly, the, the idea of death and transition between life and death 
wasn't confined to adults, it was also uh, for children. But once we get into what we call modern humans, and we're now talking 28,000 years ago, we suddenly get graves that are very, very um, uh, recognizable. Inhumations, that's, that's, the bur that's the burial being put in the entire body being placed in the ground. Um, we have the head, we have the spine, we have the arms uh, crossed over the pelvis area, fully extended. But in this particular case, this is now 28,000 years ago, the body was buried in full regalia. So all of these white uh, uh, bits and pieces that you can see in the grave, they're all decorative, uh, bone, decorative shells and stones that in this reconstruction would have, the, the, the body would have been buried, fully clothed um, in its best bib and tucker, so to speak. And so we're beginning to see once, once modern humans start to, to, to come into the scene, we're beginning to see a much greater appreciation of the transition between life and death and the probability that whoever, how the importance of the person in life was reflected in his, in his or her death. So this, is, this site in, in Sungur um, is in, in Russia, but also found an association, found in another burial associated with that previous one, was this fantastic burial really, a double burial of potentially a, um, a father and daughter or husband and wife, but a male and female, um, placed, uh, you can see head to head with loads of grave goods in terms of shields and swords and um, wooden objects and bone objects laid on either side and again, fully clothed, um, Almost again, it doesn't. It isn't beyond the bounds of, of probability that there was some sort of an idea that they were traveling. They put them in traveling clothes because they were going someplace beyond the living. Uh, again, look at the date. We're talking twenty-eight thousand years ago. So substantial, so a substantial step in the idea of of burial and what burial means and what death means to these people. Again, in, in, in the Czech Republic, uh, we have a family group, it would appear. Again, uh, you can see in the upper picture, you have husband and wife are, are male and female. Interestingly, one laid face down, one laid face up, and the third slightly to one side, but notice the arm is placed across um, to the, you can see the reconstruction here, one laid face down, one laid face up, and this other person, with its arms across the middle. Uh, so we have a, a group of three, again, again, fully dressed, again, uh, with grave goods, again, presumably uh, on a journey. But interesting in this particular case, we're starting to get figurative art in terms of these, what they call Venus figurines, um, quite clearly uh, uh, female, with large breasts, huge hips, um, the idea that the female goddess, fecundity, the, the mother earth, um, appears again and again from this period on. Um, fantastic uh, uh, bit of archaeology. But while we're into this area here now, th th this is about uh, so between 1500 and uh, 200,000 years, we have, going along with these sort of burials, we have the development of this, this fantastic cave art. So we have um, in the, 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 the lower picture is Lascaux Caves with its fantastic um, pictorial representation of animals and um, hunt, animals that presumably the people hunted. And on top, which I think is absolutely fun, amazing, again, um, some 15,000 years ago, we have these hand human stencils appearing on the walls of Altamira. Altamira is a cave in Northern Spain. Um, but what's very important to realize about both of these, although they're beautifully lit for 21st century photography, um, a lot of these paintings were in deep, the deepest recesses of dark caves. And the upper one is, uh, is a plan of Altamira. And you can see the scale there. That scale there is 40 meters. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's about 400 meters 
maybe 500 meters from the front of this cave here to the back. And similarly, Lasco, not as, not as deep, but you're talking 30 meters to get to that point and another 40 meters to get to the back. And light in these caves would have been a bowl of animal fat with a small wick attached. So the light of a less light than uh, we have today in a candle. Um, and people went into the back of these caves and made these paintings. Um, but quite clearly, ritual was becoming a hugely dominant feature of the lives of these people. And now we're starting to move into um, uh, sort of more, when I say more modern, we're moving into areas now where quite clearly ritual beliefs was becoming more and more important. And this is a fantastic burial found in northern Israel. Again, you can see the date. It's, a, it's about 12,000 years ago. Um, at that stage, uh, Ireland was under ice. Uh, so there was no sign of any human beings in Ireland um, and wouldn't be for another 4,000 years. Uh, but this burial in northern Italy or no, in, in, in northern Israel contained, uh, as you can see there, uh, three aurochs, which is a type of, of, uh, of cattle, uh, 68 tortoises, and um, the body was surrounded by the tortoise shell, the pelvis of a leopard, the forearm of a wild deer, the wingtip of a golden eagle, and the skull of a stone marten. And this is a, a reconstruction of what the lady, and they it was female, and they reckon they might have been a shaman or a witch doctor. Um, and you can see the, the, uh, the scattering of tortoise shells around her and she in a crouched position, again, with the, with the um, these, these are her legs drawn up to her, almost to her chin in, in a small pit, but surrounded by all these votive offerings. And then we move on to Jericho, which is an amazing site. And biblically, you all know about Jericho um, and people traveling around, blowing their horns and the walls of Jericho fell down. But what was happening in Jericho about 10,000 BC was this cult of um, these, these uh, uh, skulls were plastered. So the, the openings of all the skulls were, pla not all the skulls, but of, uh, the majority of, of the skulls that we found, the eye sockets were, were, were covered in, in plaster and then shells were placed inside the, uh, the skulls. And these then were kept as um, uh, ancestors and were kept in domestic uh, uh, situations. So quite clearly, um, the idea of the cult of the dead, the cult of ancestor worship was very important. And, and at the same time as, as th this was happening in, in Jericho, in a place called Shatel Kayuk, which is a, 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 a hugely important, a mega important site as far as the origins of the Neolithic is concerned, um, it's, in, it's in Turkey. Um, we have these pits with human remains dug into the floor of domestic houses. So your house would have been um, uh, built uh, and they were accessed through the roof um, and then into the floor of these houses, circular pits would have been dug and humans buried in them. So we're not getting a, um, we're not getting a differentiation between the living and the dead here. In fact, the dead are becoming very important in terms of ancestral and presumably protecting um, uh, the living. Um, they weren't put to one side in graveyards, they were kept with the living. But as I say, it's very important because Shatel Kayak is one of the earliest places that we start to get um, uh, the domestication of, of uh, farming practices, really. And it is, a, is one of the earliest uh, uh, sites where we're, or one early site where we're beginning to get um, uh, sedentary settlement as opposed to the more, no, 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 nomadic um, uh, sites that we are, are peoples that we used to have prior to this. Again, so we're getting, um, in, again in Shatel Kayak, we're getting evidence that they were worshipping the dead, they were worshipping animals, they were worshipping the domesticated animals. Um, so this idea of ritual is starting to become a huge part of the human experience. And just as a matter of interest, um, this is the, uh, the other area at uh, more or less the same time was, uh, was Egypt, where of course the cult of the dead became uh, hugely important with the building of the of the the great pyramids, but this is just a slide to show you really the origins of 
the Great Pyramids. Um, around around 6000 uh, uh, BC, uh, eat the Egyptian burial method was in pits dug in the ground um, with, uh, with bodies, uh, skeletal remains, and the, the, uh, with, with pots and, and pottery put in. That was then increased to larger rectangular pits um, with, with grave goods on one side and human bodies on the other. And then that, uh, about 4,000 years ago, they used this rectangular uh, configuration and they started to uh, build uh, low um, brick mounds on top of them, which then became stepped mounds at around between 27 and 25 BC. And then, uh, and then from those stepped mounds became the Great Pyramids from about 2500 BC. Um, interesting enough, 2500 BC, um, we were happily uh, uh, burying our dead in Newgrange. <clears throat> in fact, we were burying our dead in Newgrange in this period, uh, 275 BC. So the Egyptians were, were building these sort of monuments here when we were building our Newgrange monuments. And so we have the, then the spread of um, the Neolithic uh, from uh, the Near East. Uh, one of the main routes was through the Mediterranean, uh, from the Mediterranean uh, up through, so uh, we have a, 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 a really nice burial tomb in Malta, uh, in Spain, in Brittany, and then into Ireland. Um, and those from my previous talks will see this, um, this is Poole Nebrone in the Burren. Um, so we have this transition from, um, from the burial practices, this, this megalithic, this stone, um, burial practice of the Neolithic, which is the, the, the evidence of early farming, traveling from Malta onto the Spanish mainland, up the, up the French coast to Brittany, and then from Brittany potentially directly to Ireland. Um, and so farming and burial practices associated with the first farmers arrived in Ireland. And this is about, um, about three, 3,800 BC, so about uh, add two to that. So that's 5,800 uh, before years ago, 6,000 6, years ago, basically. And so those of you who have listened to my previous talks will have seen this slide many times before. But again, it's a really nice slide because it just shows you the chronology. So um, formal, burial, the, the, the formal burial practices in, the Irish, in Irish prehistory really didn't uh, start before 4000 BC. We don't have formal burials. We don't really have very much evidence for burials in the Mesolithic period, which is the period the hunter-gatherers, which were the first peoples in Ireland. There are some pits um, that have been found that have uh, uh, human remains uh, in it, uh, but we have no real solid evidence for, um, for burials uh, prior to the Neolithic. Um, and in the Neolithic, which I say happens about 6,000 years ago, we have our, our, early, our earliest archaeology, which is our portal tombs and our court tombs, of which we have two really nice examples here in, uh, in, um, in, in County Down. Um, we have our, our uh, fantastic um, uh, Leganeni portal tomb uh, on the slopes of Sleep Krug, and we have Audley's town on the slopes uh, or on the shores of, of, of Strangford Lock. Um, as, I said before, as I said previously in previous uh, in talks, um, it is very likely that this monument was always as dramatic as that. Um, there would have been, it would have been surrounded by a circular low cairn, probably no uh, taller than what we see today. And the burials would have been buried in underneath the large capstone. Both um, uh, cremation, which is the burying of, or the burning of bodies and inhumation, but probably not entire bodies. And the suggestion is that, that, uh, that if, if cremation was the order of the day, then only a subsample of, of the cremated bones were placed in the tomb. And if, and if it was uh, inhumation, then only um, elements of the, uh, of the bones would be put in. Um, 
the the uh, the, 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 la the the one of the few major excavations that have taken place in portal tombs was in in Pool Nebron, and they reckon from that that um, burials took place over about an eight or nine a hundred year period, but only um, uh, you know twenty odd people evidence for twenty odd people were found. So that does not mean that only 20 people were buried in Pool Nebron over an 800 year period. It is that um, only select uh, members or select parts of members of the community were buried. That's one possibility. The other possibility, of course, is that the, uh, the burials might have been cleaned out on a regular basis. Uh, but I could argue against that as well, but I won't. I'll carry on. So, um, so but one of the fantastic monuments that we have are the passage tombs. Um, again, um, showing the idea that that the dead are laid uh, in a, in a space along a long passage into a chamber. Again, dark, moving from the light of the outside to the dark of the of the interior. And uh, not surprising that people have talked about the idea of you know going back to Mother Earth, back to the womb, and um, from the from the light into the dark. And with Newgrange, again, we have the added, um, the added phenomenon there of the, um, the light of the uh, winter solstice lighting up the passage tomb, lighting up the, 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 the passage down to the chamber at the back. Um, a remarkable feat and a remarkable spectacle, but it does add again to the spectacular nature uh, and the spectacular form of burial in the Neolithic. Um, we also have wedge tombs, which again are similar um, in terms of, of a, a, a chamber and uh, the laying of a body inside in the chamber. Um, this would have been covered in, uh, in uh, an entire cairn uh, with, the, with the only access through the, to the chamber. Um, Linkerstown burials, they're interesting simply because they're a transition between um, the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. Um, we have elements of, of, of Bronze Age uh, um, architecture, but covered with very large uh, capstones, suggesting that this might actually be a, some sort of transition between um, the Neolithic, megalithic uh, stone structures and what came next, which was the Bronze Age. And there's a huge, tra there's a huge uh, transition between being buried in these sort of monuments, uh, communal monuments, massive amount of effort to build these uh, monuments, uh, stones tens of tons high, uh, weight being lifted up maybe two or three meters, um, to this, which are earth cut circular barrows with small pits in the middle uh, and cremated bone placed in pots and placed in a small pit. Uh, or, or indeed, if not in a pit, pace, placed in a in a stone lined kist um, that a family could build. Um, you know, four stones, uh, floor flat stones, um, placed in a square with the large stone on top, into which you put a pot with some cremated bone, and that's your burial, as opposed to the amount of time it would have taken to build a passage tomb or leg in any dolmen. So there's quite clearly some major change between this set of beliefs that, that, are, that brought people together to build these monuments and these ones, which are more um, local, more family-based, more um, easily constructed. Um, and it's not, it's not uh, beyond the possibility that, that this is a more private um, family-type burial, whereas the other were quite clearly communal. And then we move on to the Iron Age. And in Europe, we have these fantastic chariot burials um, coming from the Iron Age. Um, quite clearly, the warrior classes um, were dominant in, in Europe. Um, so entire chariots with horses and all the garb that goes with it were placed in large pits with bodies rested on top of them. We don't yet have a chariot burial from Ireland. Um, uh, what we do, on the other hand, is we have the classic um, 
crouched burials called crouched inhumations. That's where uh, the body is entirely um, buried, uh, but in a, in, a, in a sort of a fetal position. Um, interestingly, um, this is the classic, what they call crouched inhumation. So you have the skull, the, uh, the, the, the ribs coming down, and then the legs drawn up with the, with the, the arms almost grabbing on to the, to the, to the lower legs. But in, the, in two cases, one here in, in, um, in Nauth and the other in, um, in Baddockstown in County Mead, a stone was placed over the head of this particular burial and a large stone was placed in the midriff of this particular burial. And archaeologically, this is an interesting one. This is uh, from the first to second BC, but analysis of the, of the bones here suggests that this lady, although she was found in County Mead, um, possibly came from Scotland. Um, and uh, this one over here, um, again, local, but uh, later in date, but the suggestion is that the stones were, obviously the stones were placed for a particular reason. And one of the theories that archeologists currently are, are, have is that maybe these particular people had stones placed in order that they did not come back from the dead. They were, in other words, they were weighed down. Um, so some elements of ghosts, some elements of reappearing um, was obviously to the fore in the in the Iron Age. And then we have the early Christian period, uh, which is when Christianity obviously uh, comes to play in, in Irish uh, archaeology. Um, and we're obviously talking the post St. Patrick's so from the fifth century on, sorry, the Iron Age. The Iron Age really is from about um, 2000, uh, so 1000 BC to about uh, 500 AD, uh, classic Iron Age. And then in the uh, early Christian periods from over 500 um, to about, I suppose, 1200, really the coming of the Normans. Um, uh, but again, and sorry, in this period now, we're beginning to get um, recognizable graves laid east-west, um, albeit uh, in, in, in a lot of, in some cases, stone-lined um, uh, uh, graves, but also simple, uh, graves spread longitudinally from east to west with bodies uh, laid um, on their backs facing east to face the rising sun and um, so the biblical information the biblical um, uh, Christian Christian beliefs are beginning to come to the fore in the early Christian period and one of the fantastic monuments we have from this early Christian period are these uh, uh, high crosses and you can see arrange them there from the earliest um, sort of uh, very relatively plain uh, crosses, a, a beautiful one down in Kilbrony, um, dating to the 8th century. You have the 9th century, uh, quite sculptural forms um, uh, of a henny. And then you get Kells in the 9th century, the, what they call the scripture crosses, um, both Kells and Munster Boyce, where um, they would understand that, that these monuments um, are almost didactic. They're telling stories. They're telling stories to people, um, um, uh, you know, biblical stories. Uh, each of these particular uh, uh, passages or, or segments of the high crosses are telling um, stories from both the uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, and then right up to the 12th century, where you get these great memorial crosses, the classic one down in Dyset O.D. But somebody uh, at a previous uh, uh, lecture was talking about the fact that these crosses and the, the reason why you have this circular feature around the high cross is because originally they were um, in, they, they, they may have been made from wood. And uh, somebody, uh, uh, Dorothy Kelly, took the, uh, the Henny High Cross, which is this ninth century example, and deconstructed it and then reconstructed it again as it would have been in its, had it been uh, entirely made from wood. And you can see how uh, you have the front piece, the front element of the cross, the back element of the cross, they're bolted together by large mortises, large wooden mortises with, with, um, with uh, knobs at the back to hold the, um, to hold the, the, the two mortises together, the, the, well, the, the four mortises together. And then the circular cross to, to keep everything together. And then the entire 
the entire cross is set inside a base with a, uh, a, a butt on the top or a crown on the top to keep the entire thing together. So each of these elements in stone that you can see on the left hand side can be uh, reconstructed in terms of wooden elements. Um, so it's not, it's, not, it's not unreasonable to have seen um, these high crosses having their origin in wooden uh, uh, previous crosses. It's also, it's also just uh, by the by, it's also important to realize that there's every chance that these uh, crosses were painted when they were uh, originally, um, so they would have been sculpted um, and then painted. So uh, they would have been brightly colored, uh, adding to the, to the, um, to the, to their impact um, uh, in their original position. And then today, these are the burials, these are the burial sites that we have. Um, but interesting up top left hand corner are just a variety around the world of different uh, graveyard layouts. Um, we have higgledy piggledy ones, we have linear ones, we have circular ones around a, a core area. Um, so, so the graveyards that we see, this is a Milltown Cemetery here in the top right, and then Roselawn uh, Cremation uh, Cemetery down in the, in the bottom left. Uh, a much more sculptural, a much more sort of fluid type environment of the Rose Lawn, whereas the Milltown serried ranks of, of, of graves um, laid out in, um, in, in, the, in the form that we know today. So that's it. Um, uh, thanks very much to, uh, to listen uh, for, 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 for your listening. And I would be certainly happy, uh, a lot of information there again, but I'd be very happy to take any questions if there are any uh, online there, Aidan.